Why are Wales so goddamn hard to beat? Well, today we're going to be discussing the six reasons why and hang around to the end for a special bonus reason. Hello, amateurs, and welcome back to our Hot Topics series. And this one is inspired by the current Six Nations. And I'm putting a ton of content out during the Six Nations and beyond. So give that subscribe button a tap to make sure you don't miss out on any future content. But in this episode, we're going to be looking at why a whale is so hard to beat. And to discuss it, I've got one of my most popular former podcast guests with me, Mr. Phil Greenaway. Phil, how are you? Tim, I'm good. Thank you very much. Great, great to be here again. Good to see you. And as I said, we are looking at why a whale is so goddamn hard to beat. And there's six reasons, plus a bonus one. So hit us, hit us. What's the first one, Phil? Uh, first one that we, we I've sure will come up with, Tim. I just think that they're, they're really tough and gritty and gnarly. Uh, when it goes back to the sort of the coal mining days and the working ethic of the, of the Welsh, uh, the South Walians. Uh, I just find that they're just never beaten. They're just, you know, they're just so, so tough and gritty and just really, um, they're, they're in your face the whole time. I thought the second half against um, Scotland, they could have capitulated. They didn't. And they just so they just come across as being so tough and so hard and, and gritty and really, really hard to beat. Yeah. And it's it's interesting that that's born, that's kind of within a culture of a country as well. And I think you alluded to that with the, the kind of coal mining back background it it doesn't come from everywhere and some countries have it and some countries don't so i, I mean is are there any other examples of where this kind of shows up well, i think if you, if you look at their mall defense and you look at their the, the way they compete at rucks etc around that time and i just think that generally just that that, that sort of never say die attitude that they're just going to hold on for dear life no matter what um and they always feel like they're in the game you know and if they've got that if they've got the turnover some of the tries they score are forced through just being purely, purely belligerent on the pitch, and just as I said, that just real tough, grit, gritty uh, side to them. Um, and it's been really, really, really inspirational to watch, particularly that second half. And you know, even in that, even in that game against England, they were never out of the game. Even though they, you know, when you look at the number of caps they've got in the squad, they shouldn't have been in either of those contests, um, and took them both right to the wire. Amazing. Okay, that's number one, tough and gritty, and it kind of leads very nicely into number two, which which is they hate to lose. The Welsh absolutely hate to lose. Um, whether you're playing against them in a club rugby game, whether you're playing against them in, in anything um, across the board, they just hate to lose, and they just they're never beaten. I watched the the Wales twenties versus England twenties on um, on Friday night on the telly, um, and again it looked like physically. Power-wise, the way that England dominated the game, it looked like they should have been, you know, fifty points up. And the Welsh just hold on; they hate to lose, and they're never ever beaten. Yeah, I watched that game as well, and the Welsh scrum got absolutely destroyed. And they they looked like big lads in the Welsh scrum, but they were just motoring backwards. Yet somehow they stayed in that game, and competitive almost right to the very end. Yeah, they just keep stay. They stay in the fight, don't they? They just they hang around, and I said, I think that comes from that real. You know, hatred to lose, particularly to to England. Um, but you know, as I said, that just that real, that real grittiness and that real hate, desire just to not be beaten, and they never quite know when they are beaten. Uh, and it's a real admirable quality, I think. Yeah. And whilst talking about the under twenties, that leads us very nicely into point number three, which is anyone would think we planned this, Tim. Um, just you know how physical, how young, and how hungry they are. Um, I think that the Welsh through the academy system, they must do a really, really good job of physically looking after the, their players. I think when those young lads step in and play test rugby, they all look like they're meant to be there physically. They all look like, um, you know, they've, they've been on fantastic physical conditioning programmes. Um, and, you know, I think one of some of those lads haven't even played 10, you know, games in the URC and they're thrown into that, that sort of test arena. And they just look like they belong physically. And, you know, I guess it goes back to that that young, hungry, physical sense. Um, and you can just see that real sort of desperation about them coming through that, you know, they've, they've really had to work hard to get where they've got. Um, and, you know, it's fair play to Wales for picking them and checking the youngsters in there and, and, and saying, look, physically, you're ready. Um, just get in there and give it, give it a crack. Yeah. I'm going to back you up on there because I had some reservations about how many young, inexperienced players were in this squad. Yet they've all come in and they've all done a fantastic job. So that's that's testament to the the qualities that you've just mentioned there. 
Yeah, as I said, I mean, maybe only having those sort of four regions to, to focus on down in Wales, maybe that their RIT pathway, the WIU pathway is, is doing a great job in just terms of filtering those kids through. And clearly they've got a, a good development system down there. And, you know, they just look, they all look physically ready and able to play. When you, you see the two sides line up against each other, sometimes you see the young faces there, you know, but they are just absolutely ready, ready for the test arena. Yeah, absolutely. And... It brings us nicely on to number four because they can't do that without the people in the group of number four. Yeah, I, again, you know, I think they, they they sort of manage that spattering of experience across the squad really nicely. Um, you've seen the players that have left Wales in the last couple of years with the retirements they've had, um, but they've kept a core of guys around there around that group. Whether that be, you know, I know certain players are injured at the moment, like Falatau, etc. But they've kept those in and they've sort of really mixed and blended those guys in really really well and that's been good to see and i think that just gives those young lads the confidence to go out there and play knowing that they've got that that sort of experience you know the experience heads in and around the squad as well so yeah i think they, they do that really nicely that just that right blend of, of, of experience yeah and one person in that group that i'd like to pick out is, is george north who i thought was really really outstanding on saturday he just i mean he's a quality player obviously but he just came back into the test arena mm -hmm. and looked like he'd never been away yeah, I mean, you know, I think he probably had more test caps than, than the rest of the squad put together. And he's like 118, 119 caps George is on. And I was lucky enough to see George play uh, when he was under 16s, you know, for, for Wales. And, and he was a physical specimen then. Um, but understands the game really, really well. Transition from the wing into outside centre. Defends brilliantly at 13. Um, always in chivying the squad around, you know, making sure that the boys know what their job is next, you know, just from the stuff you see on the telly. Um, he's just a real positive influence on that squad. And, and I guess that comes from experience. You know, British Lion, still one of the greatest British Lion moments ever was him carrying uh, the, the, the Australians down the other end of the pitch. Um, but I think he brings that real, that real quality. He has been there and done it. And, you know, no matter how, what the score is, you must look up and see you've got a guy like that in your squad and think, you know, we'll be all right. Yeah, 100%. Right. Something that ties all of this together. Point number five, what's that, Phil? Yeah, for me, I just think they've, they've got a real sense of national pride that, that other countries, um, I'm sure other countries do have it, but lots of look at it, you look at that and you think, you know, being a Welshman, they love their country and they love their rugby and they love their national team. And it's the pinnacle for them all to play for Wales. And I think the great history of going back, I mean, sadly, we've lost some of those great players in the last the last six months and so, or so. But, you know, when you think of back to Welsh rugby and the national pride with Barry John and Gareth Edwards and all these people, national pride in the country, national pride in the, in the rugby, the national stadium back in Wales and how proud they all are on International Day. It's right at the heart of their their, their city, you know, the stadium, etc. And it's just, a, it's just a fantastic, it must be such a great, thing to aspire to be to be a young a young Welshman growing up playing for your country um and have that to aspire to yeah something that ties both these previous two points together was George North was answering a question about why he's still desperate to play and he's he just pointed to his shirt and said well the three feathers you know it's um it's it's such a privilege um yeah so yeah I mean it's it's deeply ingrained and some of my recent podcast guests that I've had on Welshman like they're first photos of them as babies and they've got a rugby ball next to them in the cot you know and stuff like that so it's it's every inch uh what they want to be from the moment they're born yeah and you see them sing that national anthem um there's not many like it there's not many national anthems that bring out the emotion and that that does for for those young welsh people and when it's sung with the roof closed in the national stadium um geez it's it's powerful even being an englishman and you stand there and, and you can't help but feel moved by it so uh good on them yeah, perfect. Uh, and number six, what have we got? For, what have we got for number six? Number six for me. I, <clears throat> people will always talk about the Welsh scrum halves and fly halves um, of, of yesteryear, but I think they're they just keep producing the best back row players around at the moment. For me, you look to that side on Saturday with Tommy Raphael and, and the other guys in around there. I mean, they and I guess those those guys epitomise everything else we've spoken about. You know, that tough and gritty side to them they, they hate losing they're physical they never go away uh that national pride really comes through in their back row and i think they're but i do think they're a bit better than that they're not just tough and gritty they're, they're some really smart intelligent rugby players 
Tommy Rafael really picks his, the rucks he goes into and fetches the ball from. And I think, you know, I think of the, of the, of the Welsh sides of the last sort of 15 years during their, their real, you know, boom times, so they've just got this absolute quality back row and a real nice balance to their back row, going back to the Dan Lydia days or whoever it might be. They've always had just that really nice, really nice balance to that back row. And, and I don't know how they do it, but they just keep producing first class back rows. Yeah, well, I want to pick out Tommy Rafael. I mean, it's the obvious choice, but I've just been so impressed how he's added an attacking layer to his game. His ball carrying on Saturday was absolutely outstanding. Ball carrying, footwork, uh, his line-out work is underestimated. You know, his work in the mall, at the back of the mall, um, all of those things, I just think they go go unseen. And he just keeps going. I mean, you know, after five minutes, he looks absolutely shattered. And 85 minutes later, he's still on the pitch. Uh, and still going, still trying to get that turnover. And I, I, as I said, you know, his attacking qualities, his hands, his footwork before contact, his offload, his um, yards after contact. So the, you know, the yards he makes once a contact's been hit. Um, I, I think all of them. I think they're all they're all fantastic, and they just seem to be. You know, who's the next one off off the bench? You know, I thought Jack Morgan was outstanding in the World Cup um, re- previously as well. So yeah, you wouldn't want to be playing against them as a as a ten twelve on the opposition. That's for sure. Absolutely. Okay, those are our six reasons, but don't forget, we've got the bonus reason as well. What is it, Phil? Uh, for me, I, I I I can't look past Warren Gatlin. I just think he, you know, the leadership that he shows, um, no excuses, the environment that he's created for those young young players to to thrive. Um, and I think often, you know, much like your dog reflects your, uh, you know, your, your your character, and people say the dogs look like their owners, and vice versa. I think that's very much a sense of what the Welsh side are like. They are, they are gritty, they are hard, they're gnarly, just like Warren Gatlin. And there's no excuses ever with, with Warren Gatlin. He's just, you know, straight faced, gets on, moves on to the next job. But um, I think he's a real jewel in their crown. I think they've done a great job in getting him back, and everybody was. Um, a little bit sceptical after the last uh, Six Nations last year. You know, we brought him back and the success didn't instantly happen. But I absolutely think they've picked the right character, you know, 100%. Yeah, he totally understands the Welsh psyche and the, the Welsh history and all of the things that we've kind of gone through in this episode and more, I'm sure. Um, so, I mean, this is a, a project, probably a long, medium to long term project. So it's going to be so interesting to see how it all pans out. Yeah, I can't wait. Actually, I think you know, if Warren's still there next World Cup, then I think Wales could be a really, 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 really tough side to beat in that World Cup. Um, and you know, things like the the young lad from Exeter, they don't worry about that lad picking England over Wales. They just move on, they get on with it, and they only control. They just look to control the things they can control within their own environment. And uh, yeah, it'd be. Uh, I imagine that he's a guy that you want to go out and play for, for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay, people at home, that's what we think. That's why we think Wales are so goddamn hard to beat. But what do you think? Are there any other reasons that we've missed? Anything else you think at all? Get them in the comments down below and we'll join you there for a conversation. Give this video a thumbs up while you're down there, if you don't mind. So it just leaves me to say, Phil, thanks very much again for your time today. Thanks for having me, Tim. Thanks very much. No worries. And people at home, you can subscribe there. Watch that one next. And don't forget to get out and play.